I'm actually just going to get started here now. So, okay. So today's highlights, we have, I said, like I said, we have um, two speakers and I will introduce myself to start. I am Joseph Ogredovchik. Uh, it's Ogro Dove Chick, two birds at the end. And the CZYK is a little chick. So that's the way to remember that. Uh, we have two uh, in really interesting speakers today. One, uh, uh, Jonathan Kramer. He's the VP of marketing at StoryLift, and he is the one that has the lead generation challenge. He and I will tag team to discuss his, um, his issue, his challenge, and I really encourage everyone to speak up and give an opinion about how he, we can solve his problem. Um, we have certain opinions, and that's what I'll present, um, certain methodologies we think will work. Um, and I really wanted to use this presentation to go through that process. How do you choose a model? How do you choose a, a solution to an analytic solution to a problem? Well, how do you know which one to do? Do you do a model? Do you do an ad hoc? Um, so that's what we'll talk about in the first speaker. And the second speaker is Ken Blake. He's head of analytics at AMP Agency in Boston. Uh, he's going to be talking about enabling effective analytic activation. Um, so long, long title, but... Uh, really important when we think of how analytics um, organizes itself, whether in a single in a single firm, whether a department in a corporation, and then how how analytics markets itself. How does it go out? How does it interact with its clients? What's the best way to do that? We'll go on to the next slide. This is the intro slide, and John, I will hand this off to you now. Uh, you can tell us what is going on in your world. Thanks for coming. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Joe. Uh, yes, my name is Jonathan Kramer. And um, so I run marketing for a very, very small company called StoryLift here, uh, which is out of uh, Columbia, South Carolina. Uh, it's an interesting company that actually does. And the irony here is that what our company does, the expertise of our company is lead <laughs> generation. And we have a patented technology that that helps create and generate some of the most incredible leads for our clients. But unfortunately I can't use that technology for my personal challenge. So trust me, the irony is not lost on me because every day I see how well our company performs with clients and I'm like, ah, oh, I wish I could use that for my own challenge. So what StoryLift does is uh, basically helps for-profit colleges find candidates. Um, but what we do is, and when I say for-profit colleges, some of you may not know the distinction so the difference between a for-profit and say a private university like Michigan State, University of New Hampshire, Harvard University, for-profit colleges tend to be trade schools. They're shorter programs. They, a lot of them have nursing programs. They can have shorter IT programs. So people who are looking for shorter training programs that aren't going to go back for four years, they might go to De DeVry, Lincoln Tech. Um, and there are some community colleges that fall into this category, G large community colleges in you know, New York, California, Texas. Um, so a lot of times their challenge is they're looking to fill their spots. So it's not like these state schools and, and private universities that get thousands and thousands of applications where they have to turn them down. A lot of these schools are actually trying to fill their spots. It's run like a business. Uh, some of them are family run. Some of them are run by a corporation. And I'll get into that in a second, hence you know, the challenge. Uh, so what we do is we, we have a targeting technology that allows us to use um, you know, our analytics and demographic information not, not personal information um, from people's social media activity on Facebook, Instagram, and we're able to target possible students who've, who've not even started looking yet. So most schools, you can, you can do paid search, you can advertise on, on you know, all these different platforms, that's fine, but um, we're actually able to identify high probability audiences that haven't even started looking yet. So that's, that's the key differentiator, not many people do that. There are gigantic marketing firms who specialize in just education, just schools, um, who might do the entire entire process from print media to this and that? No, we can we can help schools who have say a nursing program. They got a hundred spots to fill every every six weeks. We can help them by running a series of ads and content that suggests the idea of going back to school. Like, wouldn't it be great to go back to school? And our campaigns are unbranded. This is very important. So they don't have the name of the school. It's suggesting that idea. Almost the principle of you know how Amazon can figure out based on your your activity, what you might not have even started searching for yet, but they can sort of use analytics to decide what you might be interested in buying. It's, it's that sort of idea. So imagine demographic of a young single mother who, who works in a restaurant and they can, we can maybe glean from that sort of demographic, what their, 
you know, what their behavior is and what their affinities and attributes are. And we can start suggesting ads, maybe become a nurse, maybe become, um, you know, go back to a trade school, that sort of thing. So it's extremely successful. And as I mentioned, not many people do it. However, my challenge is finding the decision makers at these schools. And that means the VP of marketing, um, it could be the VP of enrollment, the Dean of enrollment, it could be campus president. So I've been focusing on LinkedIn. And the reason why I can't use our technology is actually because I sort of know the job title. I know the people I'm looking for. There's a finite amount. There's only a few, maybe about 500 for-profit schools in the United States. And they are run, some of them like a corporation, some at the campus level. Some of them have different campuses and schools under their brand. So it could be upwards of 1,200 schools. Um, so here's the challenge, as I mentioned. So sometimes um, it's the decision for employing an enrollment technology like ours could be made at a campus location level. So say you have a large campus in, um, say, Jersey City, New Jersey. Um, you, the campus president might be in charge of you know, that expenditure, that budget for using enrollment technology. It could be dean of enrollment at that campus, or it could be VP of marketing, um, could be the chief marketing officer if it's run like a corporation. So this has been a challenge for me um, because I'm just a one man sales and marketing. So I really have to figure out how to focus um, my energy and time and what little budget I have. And a lot of that budget goes to the actual marketing content, um, which is sort of my background. But so I've been focusing on cold email campaigns using an, an app called Cliently. Um, I'm using LinkedIn as my primary source and LinkedIn has actually led to every one of my sales calls that I've booked has been from LinkedIn and only one has been from cold email and that's of thousands of emails across multiple campaigns, um, about seven or 800 contacts over the last eight months, nine months. Um, so LinkedIn has really been by far the most successful and I just started two months ago using a, um, a call scheduling service and what they do is I provide them with a lead list they actually make cold calls and they don't pitch. They just try to get a schedule call with me. And one of the person on my team will sometimes jump on the call. So the sales process for us is very, very simple. It's only one or two calls. Like if I can just book that one call with the decision maker, we know in 20 minutes, we can get an idea of asking them questions and we can put together um, a lead projection based on our analytics within a day or two. And from there, if they like that, we may have one more call or we pitch a full proposal. So that's fairly simple. We're not talking about a long, a prolonged, complicated sales funnel here. It's really just let's get them on the phone and we can determine if it's a good match. Um, but back to the challenge of finding these sales leaders, we, it's tough to determine if the schools run like a corporation, if it's at the campus level. Um, and that's why I need to find as much data as I can on determining that person. Um, Joe, let me, if I'm running, let me know if I'm running over time here. But uh, so I have looked into, you know, Zoom Info and these very expensive um, data services, data aggregates, what have you. Uh, Dun & Bradstreet does license lists. They're, we really want to avoid using lists. But, um, but those are a bit out of my budget. Zoom Info, their lowest plan, I think, is 12000 a year. And then the one with hierarchies, which is, one that, which is what I would need, that you're talking around $20,000 a year. And I just don't. That's, that's almost my entire budget for, for the entire year. So... I need to find a way um, at least to, to approach this, have some rules or some methodology to approaching this as now it's kind of, I'm kind of getting a sixth sense of gut feeling, but how do I focus my very, you know, limited resources, so, so to speak. And what I would do is with better direction, I would focus more of that on LinkedIn. I am automating a lot of campaigns and I've connected with a lot of these people. Um, and I'm using my, my call scheduling service to actually make calls. They make 300 calls a month and some months, zero uh, calls booked. So that's an incredibly low conversion rate. The quality of the list they tell me are pretty good. They're, they're able to verify that these people are exist. Sometimes they get more information by talking to people more junior or gatekeepers. And so a lot of times they're able to verify some of this information, but still, they don't even know. Sometimes we get this person on a call and they don't even know who makes these decisions. So um, we have, Joe and I have worked, talk, discussed a few ideas and th there's probably no silver bullet and that's okay. Um, but I'd like to get your feedback um, as long as you guys understand that you can't just raise your hand and say, oh, go with Zoom Info. It's only $20,000 a year and they've got, they've got the hierarchies and that should help you. Um, unfortunately, that's, that's not in my budget. So I'm trying to find a way to focus primarily on LinkedIn. I'll use the the ancillary um, periphery services such as cold email. Uh, but I would like to, to focus really on LinkedIn. I think that's got the most data. It's got the most updated as far as profiles. And 
And then from there, I would feed that to my call scheduling service because they can place 300 calls a month and um, from then get them on the phone. So the ultimate goal is to get them to show up to a scheduled call with me. Um, cool. I don't know if that was, did I lose everybody? Uh, no, no, John, John, I think that's perfect. I think that's the right way to do it because um, so if we, if we head on to the next slide here. Um, so really what, what John is looking for is he's looking to prioritize his leads. How does he prioritize his sales leads? He knows, I mean, he can go to these schools, he can get a list of the people, he can list of the titles, but his time is valuable. So how does he do that? What, what are the people that he wants to go for? So what I wanted to do in, in prior case studies, we've shown you what the results were. But in this particular case, I really want to go through the process of discussing what the appropriate model is. Um, I know we have some data scientists here. Um, I really hope you guys kind of give a shout out for what you think this should be. Um, I'll, uh, once we get to the next slide, I'll pause it and hopefully that can be our discussion point for coming off of that. But um, so really the question then that we had that, you know, that we're working on focus KPI with John is how do we, how do we do this? How do we give him some guidance on where he needs to go and where he should spend his time? Um, and so Yo, really can I mention yep, sorry, just one thing um, I didn't mention was, and this will help you in your next frame is um, I've identified about 50 different job titles that could be possible uh, decision makers. So that adds to the complexity. See, so if you just gave me, if it was VP level, we're fine. So that's, so I just wanted to mention that Joe. So people understand that, that the, the variation of job titles adds another layer, layer of complexity to it. So um, that'll help. So what, what do we have in front of us? Binary classification. What does that mean? Well, if you think about, if you think about leads, leads are either converted or not converted. That's it. John either gets a phone call or he doesn't get a phone call. So really what, what, when we think about analytics, what we want to find is we want to find those people who are going to give him a phone call. We want, we want the phone call for him. And so how do we find the highest probability of people who will take phone calls? Um, we came up with three sort of general ways. Uh, the first way is a logistic model. This really assigns, a, it's a regression and it assigns a probability to each person at each school for each title. And it will say, yep, these people are 80% likely and these people are 50% likely. Um, and then we can rank them. And I'll get back to the output in a moment. The second way is a random forest or a decision tree. And this is really classification. It does assign probabilities, but it assigns probabilities to groups. And it's not a regression. It's not the same type of model. It just classifies verse, um, with certain variables. So in other words, school size. Well, if the school size is higher, then that might be more likely to give John a phone call or if they're lower or if they're in the middle. Um, and so trying to find those little pockets um, where school size and school type and geographic location, all those variables may play a role. That would be a, a random forest or decision tree. And then the third way that we could do this would be an SVM, which is called a support vector machine. And this is really a type of machine learning algorithm that kind of goes through the data um, and it classifies and it uses regression. It's kind of a combination of the both if you think of um, AI. So I want to stop here. And for those of you who've said that you're familiar with sales lead generation, I really hope you're comfortable speaking because I would like to hear from you um, your feelings for these model types. Um, so if you don't mind putting yourself off mute, um, and, and speaking up, I think that would be really terrific to get your input. Can I add something? Absolutely, Vivek. And then, uh, William, yeah. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll let you, uh, I'll let John answer your question. So go ahead, Vivek. So, uh, a binary classification, I think would be a good approach with a right kind right kind of a metric. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, uh, we want to look at some, we, can, we want to look at what we want to reduce, either the false positives or the false negatives. I think in this case, it would be the false negatives. So we right. want the, we do not want, uh, so for example, if we predict that this customer call is not being converted and it actually converts, we do not want to miss on those customers. Exactly. So yeah, we, I mean, yeah. we do want to, we definitely, we definitely want to be aware of that in, in, um, in our hypotheses testing for the models. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So right kind of a metric would, would add more value to this model. 
yes. deciding on on a right kind of a metric. Exactly, and I, I think that, that does bring up a point. So when you think about when you think about what models to use and how to approach this, okay. your measurement may, plays a really big role. That's that's a great point, Vivek. It, you know, wh whether you look at false positives or false negatives, and how you incorporate those will affect how you build your model. John, do you see uh, William's question there about uh, what do we know about the lead su that succeeded? Uh, yes. What do we? Um, that's an interesting question. There really hasn't. There've been so few. I'd say we. I would say liberally that we've had a little under thirty calls in the last sort of ten months, um, and that some of that was was a bit luck, and most of that was LinkedIn. So, if if you want to know what I know, I would say it's the title is with the it would be director and above. So the lowest, I mean, I guess title ranking decision maker we had was from the College of Charleston, and his title was director. Everything else has been sort of VP and above, if that if that helps. And they've been from different schools from around the country. Um, one or two were sm smaller type schools. We're trying to get the larger type schools. So I can only really tell you that off the top of my head as far as um, well, we had a couple junior that weren't, we spoke with them, but they were, they were too low on, they were too junior to make a decision or, um, be able to identify even who the decision maker was. So I'd say director level and above as far as title from what I could, I could determine for the schools who would, who had responded to my messaging. Cool. John, I did that on purpose because you're a marketer. You think like a marketer. That's, that's what you know about your data set. What you just said is what you know. And that's very typical for marketers. They don't, you don't, you don't analyze your data. You don't know exactly what, you know, what, it, what, what are the properties of these. Um, so William, from, a, from an analytics standpoint, um, we have just received the data. We haven't analyzed that data yet to determine what those markers are. We're still um, consolidating the data that we got from John. But yeah, that's, that's one of the things that we need to do is we need to understand what, what, what do we know about these leads? Do an EDA on the leads that were successful. Um, Jerry, I'll answer your question next. How big is the sample size? We have about 1,500 um, observations and about 20 of those were converted. Um, do we also have the LinkedIn profile? Uh, William, what do you mean for this? Uh, the LinkedIn profile of the people who were successful or of the schools, um, do you mind going off mute and saying it or you can write it in the, write it in okay. the chat? Okay, yes, I am referring to successful leads their profiles may tell you more about who this person is, what they think their job is in their professional career. That's and that may be the key words in there that you want to search. I, I like that idea. I like that idea a lot. We had not thought of that. Uh, Kendrick, you had a question. You said in terms of our experience as a marketer, um, do you have a guess of a baseline conversion rate? Uh, John, you want to take that one? Well, I mean, for baseline conversion rate, I'm, I can only answer for, um, I mean, LinkedIn messaging is, is fairly new and I don't know if it follows the traditional rules that I'm used to. For cold calling and cold emailing, I'm happy with the one conversion rate. I mean, anything, anything above one is wonderful. And I haven't seen uh, emails been less than that and the cold calling has been around 1% up to 3% some months and then some months zero. This slide here is the data that we have received from John so far. Um, we have basically four different data sections. And again, um, for those of you who've been involved in this, or even for those of you who haven't, please uh, comment on this data. It's, it's the more data, of course, the more data we can get, the better, hopefully, we, uh, guidance that we can give John. So the first thing we have is a list of his target schools. These are all the schools that are kind of, the, he said there was, you know, 500 for-profit schools. Is that what it was, 500, John? Yeah, it's that's that's a rough number, but like yeah. I said, some of those schools own other schools, so it's very very difficult. The numbers changing; they're going out of business. They're renaming, so about that's a safe estimate. So we got we we received from John a target schools file. Um, on that file is uh, like name, address, and other descriptions about each of the schools. Um, then he gave us a single file with just a bunch of uh, job titles, as he's mentioned, some of those director, associate director, president, VP, um, on and on. And I think there's, I think there's about, I think there's about 50 of those or something. It's, it's a good list. Um, and then we, we received from him also his LinkedIn contacts. And these were the, this is our universe. This is the people that he's con connected with on LinkedIn. Um, so this is really from here are the ones we say, okay, 
this is where the leads come from. And this is, uh, you know, these are the converted leads and this is our whole universe. And then lastly, um, we're trying to bring in, so we have each school and each school has an, an address associated with, so therefore we have a zip code. So what that means then is that, and as John said, these are brick and mortar schools. So if these are brick and mortar schools, then a zip code is probably relevant because we're, we're not talking online. If, if I live in Massachusetts, I'm not going to be applying to a school in California. So therefore I'm going to be going close to where I live. And therefore the, the, the census data at the zip code level and the department of education level about the department of education data about schools and geographic locations might be helpful in this instance. So what I want to, what I want to, just pause here is to say that sometimes, like, I don't think we have enough data from John, period. I think it's too small. It's a very small data set. But maybe if we append some of this data, we might be able to tease out some uh, business rules. And that's really what we're going for in this instance. We're going for business rules. Okay, let's move on to the next slide then. As I said, we talked about business rules. Ah, okay, yes. Um, John, you want to take the question? Yating asked if we're only targeting schools in nearby states. No, uh, so I want to clarify, it might not have been clear earlier. So <clears throat> we're targeting schools all around the country. Um, what we're trying to do is target the, the decision makers from an administrative component. So we don't really care about the students because some of these schools could, some of them have campuses all over the country. We want to find the administrative center. Is that decision maker? near one of those campuses out in California, or is that person in Chicago where the head office is, where the corporation is run? So that's been sort of the challenge too. So um, yeah, it's sort of, it's, it's sort of all over the place. Um, we, we just want to find, I think that as Joe mentioned, having that um, location data can be helpful because assuming the largest administrative offices will house perhaps the higher ranking, um, higher level executives. And yeah, and so, and so the, when we bring in this census data in the Department of Education data, we need to be very careful in the assumptions that we're making because John is looking for the decision makers and that data might be about the schools and the surrounding and the students. So there's, there's, there might be a disconnect in which this is why we're looking for business rules and not a direct correlation because some of the places may have a, an administrative office that's not near the main campus. So census data is not, might not be that helpful in that instance. But if generally a lot of those, especially for the larger schools, have the administrative office that's near their largest campus, then you can see the merging of the um, Department of Ed data with the census data and how that can help John. So I don't know that these will, be, these will be helpful. I'm hoping that there's some correlation between say school size and administrative and location, but that might not be the case. Um, and we just have to move on from there. All right, hold on, I got distracted by uh, that things. Uh, emailing methods, have you tried the greatest time? Oh yes, okay, so John, have you done anything with um, op uh, timing optimization of your email campaigns? That's what the question is. And then I'll get on to our business rules. Uh, that's a great question. Uh, I really haven't because uh, the schools have pretty much an ongoing enrollment 24 seven all year round. So they're constantly look, they don't really, some of them may have timed some of their programs with traditional semesters, so to speak. But for the most part, some of these trade schools have programs that are only eight to 12 weeks. Um, I've seen as as short as eight weeks, but usually 12, 12 is the lowest. So they're constantly enrolling, whether it's the summer, whether it's Christmas, you know, the holiday season. So I haven't really focused on, on doing that timing. If I was working with perhaps traditional schools, you know, state, state universities, private schools, then I think that might be a factor. But Considering um, the calls that I've had and even our current clients, it's 24-7, 365 days a year. It has, it has really not been from what we've seen. Um, I mean, if I looked at our, our clients, which I don't, I don't work directly with them, um, they might have certain pockets during, during the year. But for the most part, they're always looking. They're constantly, um, you know, as far as the online lead generation. Events may be a different thing, but since I don't work on, on any of the events. Um, so, yeah. I, it could be a factor, but, but so far, just based on what I know and what our client's behavior is, it hasn't, doesn't seem to be a key um, you know, deciding factor. Cool. Thank you, John. All right. So again, the business rules that we're trying to give to John might have to deal with title of the target. 
might have to deal with school size or school location, and might have to deal with some of the publicly available data. We're not certain on this yet, but these are the things that we're bringing in. And um, I really appreciate all your suggestions. Uh, I like that LinkedIn. I wanna see how we can uh, probably incorporate that. And if you do have any, any other suggestions or comments, please let me know, because we're exploring this and you know, I, we wanna help John as much as possible here. So um, thank you. And thank you, John, for, uh, for coming and being brave and telling us what your problems are. <laughs> my pleasure. I love talking about my problems. <laughs> Thank you. All right. If we move on, um, our next uh, speaker is um, all right. So we have we. Oh, so uh, Ken Blake will be up next. I'll pass it over to him in just a sec. But after after that, we will follow up with an announcement section. We have a couple of job opportunities I want to let you know about, um, and. Um, I'll say more at the time. So at this point, Ken, I'm going to hand it over to you and, um, go ahead. <laughs>